So, uh, my name's Matt. Um, I've worked with EE as a consultant um, since January. Uh, I'm based at the Home Office. I can see a few familiar faces. Um, I'm not sure if they're here for support or possibly their own uh, entertainment, but... Um, <laughs> But um, as the um, title of the slide suggests, what I want to talk to you about tonight is the need for manual testing in an agile environment. Uh, and the reason why I asked if I could talk on this particular topic is because I often think that manual testers are the unsung heroes of agile teams. And people are often uh, quite quick to big up automation and talk about the benefits of automation, of which obviously there, there are many. Uh, but then I, I feel that they don't necessarily mention uh, the people who perform manual testing enough. And then when we do tend to mention uh, people who perform manual testing, I sometimes think we do them a bit of a disservice because we'll tend to say things like, yeah, our manual tests are really good. They help us find those cosmetic bugs that uh, are hard to track down. But in my experience, and certainly the manual testers that I've worked with, they tend to find a lot more than just those cosmetic bugs and help us find things really across the whole quality spectrum. Um, and, and in particular, and it's why there's the, the subtitle of this talk is what it is, I find they're particularly good at finding bugs that our automated tests miss. Which is where I'd really like to kind of start things. Um, there's a few reasons why I think um, automated tests don't tend to catch all of our bugs. Uh, and I think it, one of the reasons is because they tend to have, be quite sort of blinkered or they tend to have some blind spots. So I don't know about everybody else, but when I tend to think about uh, writing an automated test, a couple of things sort of pop into my mind. One of the things is what part of the system or what characteristic do I want to have this automated test check? And then what sort of rule or assertion am I going to use to, to check it? So to give you a really simple example, maybe I want an automated test to check that the title bar in my browser contains the word Matt. And that's just because there's a requirement somewhere that says, you know, on every browser, on every title, you should have the user's name. And obviously, thinking about tests in this way, checking something specific using a particular rule, makes it really easy to then encode them as automated tests, generate quite a large number of them, run them as frequently as we want, and ideally run them quite quickly as well. But then this is a bit of a double-edged sword, because the downside of having tests that are kind of very focused is, like I said before, they tend to have these kind of blind spots, and they're blinkered to very much checking that one specific thing that we've programmed them to check. And then outside of that, there can be bugs lurking that feel really quite obvious. And certainly if you talk to manual testers, they'll quite often say, did the automated test not pick that bug up? That's, that's kind of an obvious bug to, uh, to see. And I just think there's a real differentiation between the sort of bugs that you tend to find through automation and the sort of bugs you tend to find through manual testing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about at least my theory for why that is later. Um, but what I want to actually do first is to try to uh, perform a lot of this session via a, a sort of live interactive demonstration. Um, so I assume most people have heard of the idea of pair testing. What I want to try to do tonight is group uh, testing. Um, it's about as kind of high risk as it sounds in terms of a live demonstration. <laughs> um, so um, please bear with me if it kind of goes slightly um, off course at any point. So um, I, I've built us a really quite sort of simple elementary thing to test. It's an online shopping list generator. Uh, and how it simply works is someone would come along they enter uh, an item that they want to add to their shopping list at the top here. They then click this button here in the middle, and then their item gets added to the bottom. And then how we're going to perform the testing is that I've already prepared in advance three automated tests that I'm going to run over sort of three hypothetical release or build cycles. And then after I've uh, run each of the tests, I'm going to give you all the opportunity to perform uh, some manual testing. Um, my good friend Simon from the Home Office, who's uh, kindly volunteered to lend a hand, he's sat over there with a second keyboard and mouse. Uh, so he's going to be kind of driving it, which just really leaves the rest of you just to kind of sit there and look for bugs. And I'll tell you a bit more about that uh, in a moment. But if I just kind of flick over and uh, show you the automated tests, um, so they're, they're writing .NET, it's uh, using Selenium, um, and I, as I said before, I've got three tests here. Um, 
probably quite an important thing to mention before I kind of kick things off is some of these tests obviously could be pushed a little bit further down the stack. So we could potentially write these as unit tests. It doesn't make for quite such an interesting demonstration, which is why I've kept them here. Um, but I thought it's probably worth mentioning that. Um, so the first test that we're going to perform is to check that when an item is added to the shopping list, then the number of items of that list increases by one. And to do that, quite simply, what we've got uh, is we're going to go to the URL for the site. We're going to take a snapshot of the existing shopping list and store that in a domain object I've created. We're then going to find that text box and enter in the item that we want to add. This week, we're buying beer. Um, then click on that button. And then finally, at the bottom, we're going to get another version of our shopping list. And of course, then the assertion just checks there that the number of items in that second list is one greater than it was before. So if I now run this test, it's going to run quite quickly. It's also going to run invisibly. I've decided to use the Phantom JS Headless Browser. I've done this on purpose because I don't really want to give you any clues before you start um, your testing. But as you can see here, that test has now passed. We've got one test passing that checks that when we add an item, when we add an item to our shopping list, then that list increases by one. So now it's, uh, it's your turn. Um, as I mentioned before, Simon is going to um, help out by manning the keyboard um, and uh, the mouse. What I'd like you all to do is, when you see a bug, simply just shout out, bug! <laughs> OK? So I'm going to warm you up. I'm going to count you in for a test run. This is the test run. Ready? Five, four, three, two. Perfect. OK, good stuff. So um, if I now flick you over to the um, live version of the site, I can then uh, pass you over to Simon, um, who can then take it away. And he wants to buy himself a horse. OK? Bug. Bug. OK, so what hopefully most of you can see in front of you here is um, the first example of what I refer to as automation blindness. So we've got a test. It's a perfectly sensible test, the sort of test you might want to include. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's doing exactly what we programmed it to do. But it's kind of missing something quite fundamental by purely focusing on the number of items in our shopping list. It's actually completely ignoring the fact that we've actually added the wrong item to it. Or in fact, we've duplicated that item. Now, one of the nice things, obviously, about having an existing automation infrastructure in place is that when we find things through manual testing, what we can do is go back to our tests and think, OK, I appreciate that blind spot exists. I can now potentially plug that blind spot for future releases by writing a test that would catch that particular bug. And this is what I've uh, prepared here in terms of test two. So our second test here is going to check that when an item is added to the shopping list, then that item becomes the last entry on the list. And similar to before, we're going to go to the URL for the site. This time, we're going to buy some wine this week. We're going to click on the Add button, get a snapshot of our updated shopping list, and then check that the last item in our list is indeed the item that we added into the text box. Now, to keep on theme with wine, and also just because I appreciate that sometimes, second time around, things can be a little bit less exciting. The first person to show up bug this time I think it's a uh, vintage of some sort. I'm not sure. <laughs> OK, so. <laughs> it, lo it looks like you're showing the wine. <laughs> OK, so we've now got two passing automated tests. They're, again, similar to before, they're both perfectly good tests. They're both doing exactly what we expected them to do. Uh, I've just realized I didn't actually even run them to show them to you, so I should probably actually do that now. <laughs> but let's uh, change over um, the release version there. And as you see now, those two tests were both passed against that second release, but as a group, Using your tacit knowledge, you've looked at it and straight away realized, is there a problem here? Yes, there is. We've found something that doesn't quite look right. 
And then just to kind of really finish off this example, um, and you know, like I was saying before, anytime we find something like this, we can sort of plug that gap, we can plug that blind spot by writing another test. I do have a third and final test here, which does just that, which is to check that when an item is added to the shopping list, then all previous entries remain the same. And if I just then run that final set of tests, So one's failed. I'm going to start this out and say that I'm uh, demonstrating the uh, red-green refactor there to you. Um, what it really means is I forgot to change over the version. If I change that to version 3 and run that again, you can say all three tests pass. If I then bring you back here, take you back over to version 3 of the site, and Simon, for the third and final time, if you wouldn't mind, <laughs> Dev. And there we have it, a third and final example of automation blindness. <laughs> okay, so um, on to kind of, I guess, the theory, or at least my theory as to why I, I think uh, automated tests find some bugs and are very efficient at it. Uh, but they fail to miss or they fail to find other bugs um, and consequently they tend to be bugs more easily found by manual testers and by people. Um, and the reason why I think this is, is you can sort of split bugs into two different categories. Uh, and that first category is a group of foreseeable bugs. And these are bugs that in a similar way to how we can imagine a piece of software before we write it, these are bugs that we can um, imagine may potentially exist before we've even interacted with the software. So you can kind of sit there and you can read through maybe the acceptance criteria on a story or some other form of requirements and think, hmm, I reckon there could be a bug here. And then you can write an automated test to check for that particular uh, situation or that particular case. But the thing is about writing automated tests is that at least to some degree, you kind of need to know what you're going fishing for, in the sense that you need to be able to kind of imagine that bug to some extent in order to be able to kind of think, well, what part of the system do I want to kind of check? And then what sort of rule or assertion do I want to use to actually kind of look for that particular bug? And this is where then the second category of bug really kind of snookers automated tests, or at least the people writing automated tests. And this second category of bug I refer to as an icky wizzy bug because these are bugs that you'll only know it when you see it. And it's not something unique to testing. People uh, will quite often refer to as what they call unknown unknowns in all walks of life. And it's just one of those things that you don't have to think that hard to really kind of appreciate that actually, I don't know everything right now. I probably couldn't second guess all the bugs in the system. And if I can't sort of imagine where they are, it's gonna be quite tricky to write automated tests to detect them all. Um, and then consequently, that might be sort of a, a better situation for someone performing some manual testing to explore the system and either sort of deliberately look at different things or sometimes even through a process of what I call sort of accidental discovery. You kind of stumble across a bug and you're like, oh, that's interesting. But an automated test would never do that. Moving on slightly then, even if you think the unknown unknowns are just a bit of a fictitious thing. And maybe if we just thought a little bit harder about our automated tests and tried a little bit harder to think of all the different scenarios, then maybe we wouldn't have this problem of automation blindness. The problem is, if you do go down that route, you've got the challenge of trying to make the implicit explicit. Because when we create an automated test, it has to very precisely say, this is the bit of system that I want to look at and this is the rule, the assertion they want to perform against it. And whilst it's typically quite easy to create a set of automated tests that will look like they fulfill the acceptance criteria on the back of a story, it is an overwhelming, probably even infinite task to work out all of the implicit requirements that we as people impose on every bit of software or every story that we play. 
And it's because of this, it's because of this kind of vast, potentially infinite number of implicit requirements that if you wanted to try to cover every case, you would have to explicitly turn into automated tests. That it just isn't possible, at least in my mind, to create automated tests for everything. And that's why, again, in my mind, you should be looking to support your automated tests with some sort of manual testing effort. Now, whilst I was up here, I thought it would be quite nice to tell you a little bit about how um, myself and the other members of the uh, sort of Equal Experts team are sort of trying to um, help our little corner of the Home Office, which is the DCJ project or Digital Customer Journey project, uh, change the way that they go about performing their manual testing. And I've got three little examples up here, and I was just going to talk through each of those in turn. So the first thing that we're trying to encourage them to move away from is the idea that you can write all of your manual tests or the final of your manual tests up front before your story or your piece of development has started, then wait a period of time and then run all of those tests. Because the problem here is that whilst you can work in that way, you're going to find yourself uh, falling foul of exactly the same problems as automated tests, which is you're, you're trying to kind of second guess what bugs are there in advance before you've really had time to explore and navigate and learn from the, the uh, software that we're testing. So we're trying to get them to move away from that to a much more exploratory approach to their manual testing, whereby there isn't really distinct phases of test preparation or test design followed by test execution. We're very much trying to kind of encourage um, you know, every person responsible for manual testing to combine their test design, their test execution, their analysis, their note taking, their reporting, all into this indistinguishable blob that we know that they are, every time they make a decision, do I need to do some more design, do I need to do some more execution, they're basing that decision upon all of the information they've learned to date, and consequently they're going to be in a much better position to fish out these unforeseen bugs, the sort of ones that we can't imagine up front. But as they learn more about the system, then potentially the penny starts to drop about particular things. And they start thinking, oh, actually, maybe this could fail in this particular way over here, and they can go and explore that. And like I mentioned before, sometimes simply just using the system on a day-to-day -day basis will often lead to accidental discovery as well. The second thing that we're sort of trying to encourage them to do is reduce the amount of detail and I guess also the precision in the uh, manual tests that they write. So historically, there's uh, been sort of quite a pattern there where whenever someone wants to document, either before or after they've run a test, how that test is run, they tend to write really quite detailed manual test scripts that again explicitly say to go to this part of the application, check for something specific, go to this other part of the application, check something else very specific. And again, that starts to look and feel and sound very much like an automated test. So if you do have something very specific in mind that you think it's going to catch a bug, you're probably much better off giving that as a task to an automated test that can then kind of run it frequently and, and probably much quicker than a person can. And then leaving the, the manual testers to explore and investigate particular areas for particular reasons. And I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think you can see the, the example here in the middle. So um, one of the stories that we, we played, and then we played again, and then I think we played again, is that I only have one name. It's uh, far trickier than it actually sounds. But when we come to um, expressing the manual testing that we wanted to do for that, we just wrote little things like this. So small little test objectives that said things like, explore what happens if both a given name, family name, and a single name are provided. So you'll notice that there is no expected result here. We haven't included any specific test data. We've simply just kind of said, this is an either or type of question. When people encounter it, they should really be only given a given name and a family name or a single name. But we're curious to find out what's going to happen if we do both. So we're just looking at a particular area and we've got a particular kind of, kind of problem in mind, but we're not being specific about what we're checking for. And it's the same with the, the second example, possibly even to a greater extent, which says investigate whether the single name field is vulnerable to a cross-site script and attack. Again, that's left up to the person that's performing that test to decide, you know, how am I going to go about doing that? How many attacks is enough? What sort of variety do I want? And the reason why we don't try to pin these things down up front, like I was saying before, is if you try to second guess everything, 
you're probably going to miss some things. Whereas each time you perform an attack, if you're basing that particular test based upon all the knowledge you've gained from all of your other tests and all your other interactions, there's probably a good chance that that would be the best test you can perform at that particular amount of time. We quite often talk about minimising the feedback cycle. And it's, the same really applies to tests. So I've thought of a test. Is it a great test? And you want to kind of, kind of keep that feedback uh, as quickly as possible. And by deciding that on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously you can do that really quite quickly rather than preparing them all up front and then executing them much later. The third and final thing that I just wanted to mention, um, because not just at the Home Office, but elsewhere, I don't think it necessarily gets enough airtime, is that people tend to think about testing at its extremes. So they tend to think about manual testing, and they tend to think about automated testing. And people rarely think about what's actually in the middle, which is often using tools or utilities to support some sort of manual testing activity. And people think these need to be kind of quite grand things. And I've deliberately picked probably the most simplest utility or tool that I occasionally use at the Home Office, which you can see up here in the screenshot. And all it simply is is a little script that each time a page loads on our website, it finds all the labels and it puts pass or fail buttons next to them. And then as I'm doing my testing, probably for some sort of cross-cutting stories, we might be looking to um, update all the validation uh, across the site or something like that. I don't necessarily want to um, have a big long list in advance. Or I don't want to have to go through the time consuming process of creating a big long list in advance of all of the different fields that I might actually check and keep a note of how I'm actually testing those. By having something like this, when I click on the pass button, automatically in the background, that label is going to get logged along with a pass next to it. If I click on fail, there's a, a really simple uh, JavaScript prompt going to appear. I can put it in a note. And that is then saved alongside the label too. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not very exciting, Matt. But it's surprising how the, the, the smallest, simplest things can really streamline your testing. Because what I've uh, sort of allowed myself to do here is stop context switching. So no longer am I having to kind of flick backwards and forwards between Jira, which is the tool of choice at the home office, and the website every time I want to make a note, and then I want to do some testing, and then I want to make a note, and then do some testing. This allows me to stay very much focused on the site, I don't have to worry about copying and paste errors or making reference to the wrong field. It's kind of right there. And just something as simple as taking notes during an exploratory test session can be handled with a simple little utility like this.